Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started because we have a really packed agenda today. Thank you so much to everyone for joining. This is our fourth annual um, New York State Children's Environmental Health Center Summer Academy Student Showcase. I'm Dr. Sarah Evans. I'm one of the co-directors of the Academy, and I'm also an assistant professor of environmental medicine and climate science at Mount Sinai. So we wanna really jump right in so that the students will have ample time to share their work. Uh, but first I wanna thank all of our faculty, partners and supporters for joining. I'm really thrilled to be able to welcome representatives from the offices of our New York State elected officials today as well. Um, so we have representation from across the state, including the offices of Assembly Members Epstein, Gunther, Gray, McDonald, Suffront Forest, Paulin, Flood, Lunsford, Levenberg, and Giglio, and Senators Baruch, Salazar, and Harkum. Um, please do chime in if I missed anyone. And since we don't have time to do introductions for everyone, um, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. And so as you'll hear from our Nice Check Director, Dr. Maida Galvez, the work that we do at Nice Check, including our Summer Academy program, um, is aimed at improving the health of children and communities. And it's really only possible with the support of policymakers and advocates from across the state. Um, so I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Galvez to give just a quick introduction to our Nice Check network. Um, oh, Thank and you. I will share my screen, sorry. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dr. Evans. I am so excited to join you all today. Um, New York State Children's Environmental Health Center, this is literally the highlight of my summer, is being with you together. Um, and so the NICE Check Centers are the first in the nation state-based network of children's environmental health centers in the country, as Dr. Evans mentioned. Um, I think we're going to get some slides up. It truly takes a village to get these, um, to launch as you see in this first picture here, the network from across the state serving urban, suburban and rural families um, and their environmental health needs. And you can read about it in this American Journal of Public Health article, Building the Nice Check Centers, a replica model. We hope this is the first of many state-based networks in the country. Um, together with Perry Sheffield, I co-direct co the Coordinating Center for Nice Check. Um, and it is the fact that it functions as a network is something we're incredibly proud of. Next slide, please. Um, and so there are centers uh, across the state in Albany, Buffalo, Syracuse, Rochester, Westchester, New York City, and Long Island. Um, you can read more about it in the National Academy's um, proceedings of a workshop toward a future of environmental health. Um, so they're located at those children's hospitals. Um, next slide, please. And they're serving the needs of families. And so over 95,000 services for families um, in the past year, um, 60,000 patients were screened for environmental health concerns, over 8,000 healthcare professionals educated and over 700 trainees. Um, something that we're incredibly proud of is the Nice Check Scholars Program, which is building the children's environmental health workforce across the state. Um, and you see that we've had now three cohorts, um, the first class in 2020, uh, in 2018, the next class in 2020, and now we've uh, over doubled our scholars um, in 2023 um, with 12 scholars across the state. Um, and this is a pipeline of leaders, and it's already seated leaders. And so you can see in that first cohort, um, Dr. Amy Brown, who's one of the co-leaders of this um, Summer Academy, along with Dr. Sandy G, um, who's stepped into the medical director role for her Finger Lakes Children's Environmental Health Center, as has Sarah Ventry in the 2020 cohort. Next slide, please. Um, what we're doing is making an intentional shift. We're integrating prevention into um, clinical practice and specifically environmental health prevention. And so linking pediatric healthcare professionals um, to environmental health resources that can then connect families to healthy health, healthy homes interventions that they need conducted by community partners. Next slide. And so what we're aiming to do is prescribe healthy homes for all families, but especially um, for children with asthma. And you can see that for many families, home is not a refuge, that it is a place that is a source of constant stress. Um, but we have the ability to connect families to the interventions that they need. And this is an example of the work that can be done. So Little Sisters of Assumption will go in 
um, do an assessment and then provide the interventions that those families need. And you can see how this addresses not only peeling pain, but moisture and mold um, and pest management as well. Next slide. And so across the state, nearly 170,000 New York State families have been screened for healthy homes concerns through the general pediatrics practice and the um, pediatric pulmonolo pulmonology practice. Clinicians are screened uh, are screening and connecting families through prescriptions for prevention. And the next slide will show um, some of the interventions that take place. So this is integrate, integrated pest management. And these community partners are integral um, to, the, to providing families with um, the interventions they so need. Protecting children from wildfire smoke was um, in the news last summer um, and through the NICE Check Network, um, and, and, and in the news again this summer. Um, and we were able to uh, send out um, through patient channels of the NICE Chat Network, um, key messages on what families could do to prevent and reduce their exposures to wildfire smokes through um, all our patient channels through the NICE Chat Network and reaching millions of families across the state and in the region. And we're especially proud of um, the pipeline of future leaders in children's environmental health. So Dr. Chase Moon it was on a pediatric environmental health elective with us. He's joining our team in August um, and is already a climate leader. Next slide. And we're here today to hear from those new leaders from the Nice Check Summer Academy. And those voices of youth have been the most impactful in affecting change. Um, this is an example of a five-year-old who sang the proclamation on Children's Environmental Health Day every second Thursday in October. Um, and that's why I'm so excited to join you all today um, to hear from you all as the new leaders of the field. Um, I just wanna turn it back to um, our Summer Academy faculty who are truly rock stars, our community partners that co-lead this effort, um, and look forward to listening and learning from all of you. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Thank you so much, Maida. Um, so before I turn it over to the students who are really the stars of the show today, I just wanted to give a brief overview um, of what the Summer Academy is and acknowledge all of uh, the individuals who made it possible this year. Um, so the students participated in an eight week virtual program where they learned foundational principles of public health and environmental health um, from our nice check faculty and partners. And then they worked in mentor teams to apply these concepts to climate change advocacy projects. And this year we had great representation from 40 students from all across the state. Um, and these students range from high school students. So some of them were as young as uh, sophomores in high school, all the way through college, um, medical school and graduate school. And this is one of the things that's really unique about this program is that multi-level learners um, come together um, and work on these projects as a team. Um, and so, um, the learning objectives of this program, as I said, were really to provide the students with fundamentals of public health and environmental health, helping to create this pipeline of future leaders um, that might have described. And in addition to getting that didactic training, they really got to learn to practice how to communicate and create key messages related this year, specifically to climate impacts on health, um, and to identify change um, solutions to make change. And so a major goal is really to empower these students um, as environmental justice advocates. So this is something that they can take forward um, with them through whatever career they choose. Um, and so our team consists of our, our co-directors, Dr. Amy Brown from the Hudson Valley, Dr. Sandy G from the Finger Lakes region, Dr. Cappy Collins on Long Island, and our partners at Hunt Huntington Breast Cancer Action Coalition on Long Island, Melanie Gabrell and Karen Miller. And this year, um, our projects were really made possible through the mentorship of some of our environmental health scholars um, who might have mentioned in her presentation. Um, and you're gonna be hearing a little bit from them about how they guided their students. And we couldn't do this with without John Colhane for IT support, our alumni facilitator, Mackenzie Steen. We love to bring our, our former students back to work with us um, and Michael Ejiogu's um, administrative support. And so we had a core curriculum that was delivered from faculty across our network, but also from some really key partners um, who enhanced our curriculum so much this year, including um, US EPA, Clean and Healthy with Bobby Wilding, um, American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute. So students um, really got to hear from a diverse set of faculty. 
Um, and you're going to hear about the advocacy projects that they did. And what they were really charged with doing was learning how to do a, a literature review related to climate and extreme health, um, extreme heat, to um, identify who their elected officials were, um, learn how to look up New York state level policies, um, explore evidence-based upstream interventions that might address this problem of extreme heat and health, um, identify vulnerable populations using publicly available databases and mapping. Um, and then, as I said, really learn how to communicate these key messages back to decision makers um, and propose new or expanded advocacy strategies. And that's what you're going to hear about now. Um, we divided the students up into four mentored groups focused on what, what you all know are very large regions of New York State with very diverse populations, um, Western New York, Central New York, the Hudson Valley region, and the New York City, Long Island region. And so I'm going to turn it over now um, to our Western New York group to share um, their findings. Thanks, Dr. Evans. Um, I just want to speak. This is Dr. Sandy G from the University of Rochester, and I'm the director for the Finger Lakes Children's Environmental Health Center and former environmental health scholar. I'm so grateful to New York State for all the support that's helped to grow this network and give us opportunities to, to grow and mentor students. Um, I'm sorry, Rebecca Prasad is not here. She's an environmental health scholar who's really been helping to lead this advocacy group. I'm going to turn it over to Claire, I believe, who will start off for the Western New York Finger Lakes region. Thank you. Um, my name is Claire. Um, I live on Long Island, New York, and I'm a high school student. So how can we protect students from the impact of extreme heat? Next slide. Um, so this is everyone who kind of collaborated with us and they'll all be like introducing themselves throughout the slide. And we're all kind of from all over New York. So it's like everywhere has equal representation. Next slide. What's happening? What is extreme heat? Next slide. How and why is extreme heat happening? Humans heavily rely on the burning of fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and gas. Burning fossil fuels releases large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide traps heat in the atmosphere, leading to global warming. This process is called the greenhouse effect. Next slide. Hi, my name is Jasmine, and I'm a student at Binghamton University. So what? How extreme heat impacts us? This is how extreme heat impacts learning. A 2021 report by the Center of Climate Integrity estimated that between 1970 and 2025, there will be a 39% increase in the number of school districts that experience 32 or more days above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, as shown in this map. Next slide, please. Challenges with concentrating in school without AC. Many students face challenges concentrating in school when there's severe heat conditions. As seen in the data below from a real experiment, the effects of an overwhelming amount of heat only cause negative impacts. Next slide. Here are some Harvard studies that have correlated um, the effects of extreme heat on learning. Um, one study showed that New York City students scored lower on hotter days and noted that Black, Hispanic, and low-income students were three times more affected by extreme heat. And another study showed that um, for each uh, degree Fahrenheit hotter it was, um, it reduced students' learning by 1%, um, as, as reflected in their PSAT scores. And it also reduced their chances of on-time graduation. Hi, my name is Sam Skides. I'm a senior at Somers High School in Westchester. How is extreme heat impacting health? 
Heat advisories are important notices issued within 12 hours of when extreme heat conditions are expected. And although crit criteria slightly differs depending on geographic location, these advisories are triggered when temperatures are forecasted to exceed roughly 100 degrees Fahrenheit for at least two consecutive days. Such extreme heat can be detrimental to one's health and can lead to heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Understanding and responding to these advisories are, are essential to ensure safety and prevent health-related illnesses. Next slide. Hi, my name is Hannah. I'm from Long Island, and I'm a rising junior at the University of Rochester. And I was, as Sam was saying before, there are significant impacts of heat exposure on our bodies. And as an EMT, I've seen firsthand how crucial it is to be ready for the summer heat. Um, when we're exposed to excessive heat, our bodies try to cool down through sweating and dilation of blood vessels. But when it's really hot and humid outside, it's harder for our bodies to thermoregulate. So when the core body temperature exceeds 101 degrees Fahrenheit, we risk developing hyperthermia. And this condition can cause fainting. And if untreated, it can escalate from heat exhaustion to heat stroke, which is life-threatening if not corrected by emergency medical care. Next slide. Hi, my name is Maya Galhotra, and I'm a high school student in Long Island. And schools in the Rochester City School District dismissed early three days the week of June 17th due to intense heat in that area of New York. And the early dismissals apply to grades K through 8 on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday of that week. And these schools did not have proper air conditioning. And in addition to this, after school activities were also canceled on those dates. These students could have missed an important game or a test, and this shows that heat not only affects health, but also education. Elementary students in East Arondequoit, Fairport, and Pittsford also had half days that week. And as shown in the graph, there has been an increase in the number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So certain groups are more vulnerable to the effects of extreme heat and understanding these risks is essential for effective prevention and response. So people with pre-existing health conditions such as heart disease, obesity, diabetes, and more are particularly at risk. Low-income communities often lack the resources to stay cool and safe during heat waves. Children are another high-risk group to, due to their limited ability to thermoregulate. They're dependent on adults for care and they're or so often unable to remove their own clothing or escape hot environments. Urban residents are also more at risk due to the urban heat island effect. And it's important to understand that these factors often overlap, creating compounded vulnerabilities through lens of intersectionality. And this table is sourced from the Erie County government summary plan for climate hazards and it highlights some of the most obvious populations. Next slide, please. So extreme heat significantly impacts children, particularly in the context of their education and daily lives. So during heat waves, schools may close, causing educational disruptions and creating gaps in learning because teachers may struggle to complete the curriculum. And many schools also lack adequate air conditioning or cool down areas, which further exacerbates the problem. And when schools close unexpectedly, families, especially those um, of low income, face the challenge of finding childcare. Parents often have to take time off work to care for their children, which can lead to more financial strain. And as I said before, extreme heat can worsen chronic health conditions in children. Next slide. Hello, everybody. My name is Rahi. I graduated from Wofford College down in South Carolina. I'm also interning with the University of Rochester Medical Center for summer, and I'll be talking about maps for a couple of slides. So. Firstly, on the map on the left shows the extreme heat vulnerability in Monroe County, but also broadly Western New York. Near inner cities and rural areas tend to be most vulnerable, as mentioned by Hannah. Um, the map on the right is graphical depiction of New York migrant climate. Um, you can, as you can see, the whole near Western New York state is moving down close to um, deep south, like states like South Carolina, Georgia. Uh, next slide. Now let's zoom in and focus on Monroe County. This map depicts social vulnerability to extreme heat in Western New York predicted for 2030. Darker areas on this map are the most vulnerable, especially for Monroe County is census tract 74.01 with um, social vulnerability of 0 0.99. Um, and for Western, Western New York, it's not uh, depicted on this um, map, but Chautauqua County is, um, is the most vulnerable with um, 0 0.72. Next slide, please. While the maximum days is below 
um, 20 days, as you can see on the lab, um, lab with the map, mostly been um, golden yellow. But it's important to know that 10% of Rochester's children have asthma, especially in the city, uh, which is one of the highest in the nation, as you can see on the right, with the red being the uh, 95 to 10% child for asthma prevalence. Um, this maps also have schools um, listed. I can you can see little. I think you can see little circles with the um, little building, and uh, there are about 30 educational institutions in this red area, which is a um, high number of educational institutions, and soon heat is a trigger for asthma as more harmful particles will be in the air. Next slide, please. Now let's zoom out to a national map. This map shows the risk of heat-related impacts during June 20th, um, 2004. The week that school were closed down, as mentioned by Mara earlier, the legend on the right explains colors on this map. Green being the lowest, and you can you know on this map on the uh, lab you don't see a lot of green, like really light green, but you can see that there are a lot of purples and red up in New York, especially Western New York. And purple is purple and major are really really high risks, and I do want to highlight that. Green, um, sorry, um, purple does say this is a rare, this is this level of rare and long time, long duration of stream heat with little to no overnight really affects anyone without factor cooling. And but children are especially vulnerable as outlined by my colleagues um, earlier. Next slide. Hi, my name is Juliet and I'm from the Albany area and a recent graduate from the University of Chicago. So, Given the health risks posed by extreme heat and the evident impact it is already having in New York schools, as we just laid out, now what? What are the next steps we can take in New York to mitigate health impacts of extreme heat? Next slide, please. I'm really excited to discuss this newly introduced assembly bill in New York, which marks a landmark step forward in ensuring the health and well-being of our students and teachers. First, this seminal bill claps, caps classroom temperatures at 88 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a really significant move that prioritizes the safety and comfort of our school environments. By limiting how hot classrooms can get, we drastically reduce the risks associated with excessive heat, such as heat exhaustion and dehydration, dehydration as we outlined earlier. Moreover, cooler environments enhance learning, as we talked about earlier, when classrooms are kept at a comfortable temperature, students are more focused and perform better academically, leading to improved educational outcomes. Finally, this bill represents a proactive approach to the challenges posed by climate change. It sets a really important precedent for future legislation, demonstrating our ongoing commitment in New York to creating sustainable and resilient educational environments. Next slide. Hi, my name is Penelope. Um, I'm from the Westchester area and I'm a, I'm a rising senior at Syracuse University. Um, so I'm just here to talk about some additional considerations to ensure equity um, when talking about this bill. Um, something to consider is that schools might switch to online learning or cancel classes if air conditioning is not maintained or if it exceeds the 80 degrees. Um, additional considerations, um, outdoor periods such as recess and physical, physical education could be affected or canceled, and these are obviously beneficial periods to the students' learning. Um, we also need to consider extra funding towards um, these schools. Obviously, these are all going to public schools, so we need to just keep in mind that some schools might fall behind, some disadvantaged schools with less funding need more funding. Um, and also we need to think about how um, community support programs need to be put in place for children and elderly and other vulnerable, vulnerable populations. Next slide, please. Um, so for strategies and co-benefits of the strategies that we are putting forward, um, first we need to think about funding. Um, in order, and we need to think about obtaining grants, budget reallocations, public and private partnerships for teachers and schools. Um, for a lot of funding for um, box fans and water coolers and other um, extreme heat um, 
um, measures that schools would take, a lot of the funding goes on to teachers. So we would need, it would be um, beneficial to provide that funding for teachers. Um, and a co-benefit of this strategy would be improved resources, energy saving, and improved infrastructure. Um, we also need to consider educational and com progr educational programs and community involvement, programs for parents, teachers, students, and school administrators on how to prepare for the heat wave and how to keep themselves cool as well as the students cool. Um, this would help enhance preparedness for future, future heat waves and emergencies. Um, and the last thing we found was just to follow other state guidelines. So a lot of states in the South are, that are much hotter than New York have a lot of programs and um, educational awareness set up for their state on their um, Department of Health um, website. Next slide. Continuing on with next steps and potential strategies, along with their co-benefits, we can learn valuable lessons from global strategies as well that have successfully addressed similar challenges. European countries like Germany and France have implemented green roofs and extensive shading around school buildings to reduce indoor temperatures naturally. Green roofing and shading have many co-benefits, including redu reduced urban heat, lower energy costs, and enhanced biodiversity. Another global strategy to look towards is school schedule adjustments. In some regions of Australia, the Caribbean, and the Middle East, schools adjust their schedules to start earlier in the day and finish before the peak afternoon heat. I was actually recently teaching in Guadeloupe last year, and Guadeloupe is a small island in the Caribbean that faces very hot temperatures every day. So students in Guadeloupe follow this model and they start school much earlier than we do in the US. And I witnessed several co-benefits to this schedule change, including improved attendance, better learning outcomes and family flexibility. Finally, countries such as Mexico and parts of India have started using heat resistant and reflective building materials to construct school buildings that stay cooler. Co-benefits to the strategy include increased building dur durability, energy savings, and resilience to extreme weather. Now, it is certainly important to recognize that solutions must be context-specific. However, we can still learn from these global strategies and use similar ideas in here in the U.S. Going back to green roofing at the top of the slide, we actually have an example of potential implementation of similar programs in the U.S., the public school green rooftop program sponsored by Representative Velasquez in New York would provide grants for installing and maintaining green roof systems. Although this very innovative bill has not moved forward, it's a great example that would have lasting benefits and co-benefits for students, teachers, and our overall communities. Next slide, please. Call for action. We urge our policymakers in Monroe County to support a bill to optimize learning conditions for students facing extreme heat. It is very difficult for students to learn in extreme heat as well as pay attention or do any work while constantly sweating and needing water. This is a very important start for New York State. In some states where temperatures can reach up to mid 100s, there is no legislation for shutting down schools when temperatures rise. You can make the change to turn New York to a state leading in protecting our children from extreme heat. Next slide. Closing remarks. Extreme heat is something that New York State has to face due to the reality of climate change. Extreme heat causes severe health issues and disproportionately affects children, low-income communities, and or those with pre-existing health conditions, disrupting daily life and education. The New York State bill capping classroom temperatures at 88 degrees Fahrenheit to protect health is an amazing move to protect our children and their education. More planning is needed to assure equity for our children in school. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you so much for that really informative and cohesive presentation. I thought that was amazing. Um, we have time for maybe like one or two questions or comments. 
So um, feel free to put a question or comment in the chat or raise your hand or go ahead and unmute um, if you have any questions or comments about extreme heat in Western New York. You're getting uh, compliments in the chat. Um, and uh, let's see what's coming in here. Um, fantastic job, great presentation. Um, this was really excellent. I think um, you did such a great job. One thing that stood out to me um, was a focus on equity and really considering um, potential harms by some of these policies that seem really protective and considering you know, who, who might benefit the most, but also who might be harmed. And when we think about climate justice, which is really the goal here, um, we have to consider whether policies might be harmful um, to certain vulnerable groups. And I think you did a great job of that and of pointing out uh, potential solutions um, to those problems. I thought that that was really excellent. Um, Jen Becker says, great presentation. There's a lot I've not thought about related to education and extreme heat. And I think that's another um, theme that we're hearing um, is that you all put this into a personal context. This is something that we are all experiencing right now today in real time and that we're each impacted by um, in our daily lives. So I, I think it's really excellent that you um, talked about your own personal experiences and what students experience in the classroom. I can't see if anyone raises their hands, but <laughs> I'm assuming um, there are no hands raised at the moment. Um, Deb Nagan said, it's great to learn from other states and countries, um, which is a really excellent point. Um, and so I think if there are no other um, burning questions or comments, um, you all can feel free to continue to ask questions or comment. Um, in the chat as we proceed. And then if we have time at the very end, um, you know, we can we can ask more questions of the individual groups. Um, but we're moving from west to east now. I'm gonna pass it on to our um, Central New York Capital Region group to share their findings. Yes, hello everyone. I'm Olivia Malvesi and I am the group facilitator for the Central and Capital Region. Our next slide will show everyone in our group Go to the next slide, please. Uh, all the students have done a really great job this summer. They've put in a lot of work. Uh, they're going to introduce themselves as they present. And we wanted to thank all of the legislators from our region that are attending and other attendees that are here today. Um, and we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm from New York City, and I'm a rising junior at College of the Holy Cross. Um, so in the capital region during the week of June 17th, many schools had to dismiss early due to extreme heat. There were highs of 97 degrees with a heat index of up to 104 degrees. Some school districts expressed the concern that in heat like this, students should not be outside for more than even 15 minutes. This also brings up the problem of air conditioning in schools because in Albany, for example, even though all schools have air conditioning, it does not always work. Despite this, Regents exams were still held with only some exams being given in air-conditioned spaces. Uh, so when we think about why this extreme heat is happening, we have to look at climate change. Um, some causes of climate change are generating power by burning fossil fuels, cutting down forests, um, transportation that runs on fossil fuels, emissions from food production, and overconsumption. Um, this is important because one major effect of climate change is hotter temperatures. This is because the rise of greenhouse gas concentrations causes the rise of global surface temperature. As you can see a little bit about how this happens in the image um, in the corner, it shows how the energy from the sun that warms the earth gets trapped by greenhouse gases. Hi, I'm Sophie. I'm a rising senior at Geneva High School, and we wanted to focus more specifically um, on Albany just to kind of demonstrate. You can see um, in the upper left graph that we've already experienced, especially in the summer, a big temperature increase from 1970 up till 2022. And you can see um, in our other graph here, 
that it's not just isolated to summer temperatures. We're seeing it across all the seasons, which is indicative of greater um, warming in general. And then the bottom graph here, you can kind of see um, how carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has kind of fluctuated for a very, very long time. And then um, from 1950 on, we've had this huge, huge um, spike that is contributing to the heat that gets trapped in and um, that global warming. Next slide, please. Okay, and then continuing on with Albany, um, we know that these temperatures are going to continue to rise even if we stopped um, all of our harmful behavior now. Uh, and you can kind of see across time here how some of these higher temperature days, um, the hotter they are, the more health impacts they have. And you can see how many days um, we have now and then our predictions. Um, over on the bottom right here, you can see how 30 years ago, we had a very limited number of those above um, 100 degrees Fahrenheit days and how this year and then going into, again, uh, 30 years ahead, it's increased, um, it's predicted to have a large increase and that's gonna come with a lot of health impacts as well and strain on these central and capital regions of New York. Hi, my name is Noor Naeem and I'm a second year medical student at New York Medical College. Um, next slide, please. So extreme heat is in, in very important because it affects our health at every stage of life. Um, during neonatal and early childhood development, rising summer temperatures have been linked to an increase in congenital cataracts in New York State. Um, cataracts basically cloud the eyes and impair vision, and these can develop because heat can act as a teratogen, which is basically a factor that can cause malformations. Um, continuing to during childhood, the usually in predominantly Black communities, they often face poor housing conditions in urban areas, and because of that, they experience higher rates of asthmatic exacerbations. Um, the adverse effects of substandard housing are exacerbated by extreme heat specifically, and that puts them at significant health risk. Additionally, there is an increase in the risk of injuries because um, as the temperature gets warmer, children are spending more time outside, and that leads to a higher likelihood of unintentional injuries. There's also been a, an association between elevated temperatures and increased aggressive behavior, and that contributes to an increased risk of uh, intentional injuries as well. In adolescents and young adults, especially with those with pre-existing mental health conditions, um, they also get severely impacted by extreme heat. Research has found that there's a positive correlation between uh, mental health related emergency room visits and days that have elevated temperatures, again, particularly in vulnerable communities such as Black and Hispanic communities. Older adults are also not spared from the effects of extreme heat. On extremely hot days in New York State, research has found that there is an increased risk between um, cardiovascular disease-related emergency room visits in older adults. Specifically, this includes an increased risk of ischemia, hypertension, and dysrhythmias. So it's basically evident that extreme heat isn't just a problem for one specific group. Rather, it's a pervasive problem that affects basically everyone. Next slide, please. Hi, my name is Claire, and I'm a second year medical student at SUNY Upstate University. Um, and in order to discuss the interventions that we wanted to look at, uh, and which areas, um, in order to discuss interventions we wanted to look at, which areas in our large and very diverse region were the most vulnerable to extreme heat effects, um, we found that heat vulnerability was more observed in urban areas due to infrastructure that reduces open vegetative space and instead opts for surfaces that retain heat, such as pavement. In addition, we noted that in rural areas, elderly populations are more vulnerable due to lack of access to healthcare and social isolation. So we decided to focus on the Onondaga and Albany counties um, since they showed increased vulnerability, had increased pediatric populations, um, and uh, should be an area of focus for interventions because of these um, um, reduced vegetative spaces. Next slide, please. Um, we. 
uh, looked at this map of the entire state to see the increased heat vulnerability in many areas throughout the central and capital region. And we zoomed in on a few specific areas of our region so we could further discuss how these counties um, are vulnerable. Next slide, please. Hi, I'm Audrey. I'm an incoming student at the School of Public Health um, for a master's in public health program in the fall. Um, so building on what Claire just talked about, this is the New York State um, created a heat vulnerability index that has kind of four large categories. There's multiple factors that go into each, but they used language vulnerability, socioeconomic vulnerability, environmental and urban vulnerability, elder isolation and elderly vulnerability to kind of get these numbers. So the darker blue is show, showing higher vulnerability. So as we can see, there's areas in Ogden, Onondaga County, Albany County. And then we also took a look at Jefferson County because we have a pretty large range um, in our area and wanted to look at maybe a slightly more rural county. Um, and there's definitely still some level of vulnerability there as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, here we've taken um, hos hospital rates of hospitalization in ED visits for um, heat related illness. So on the bottom it shows the month and on the side it shows per rate per 100,000 people. So we we're looking at Albany County, Onondaga County, Jefferson County, and St. Lawrence County. And as you can see, the numbers are somewhat similar um, in each county, but they they definitely have some increases along the way. Um, this data only goes up till 2016. So I would imagine if we look at 2016 to 2024, we would see more increases as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so then we were able to, to map out asthma um, rates. So the dark red is like high rates of asthma. Um, and as we know, asthma is exacerbated by extreme heat. And then I was able to overlay that with the green dots, which are public housing developments. So as we can see, those areas of really high asthma rates directly overlap with the public housing areas. And just to show that like, that's just one of many vulnerable groups that's impacted by extreme heat. Um, next slide, please. And then we couldn't do the same thing in Syracuse and see the exact same pattern. Um, okay, and then next slide, please. So this is Watertown, which is a slightly more rural area. So we can see there's some overlap. It's slightly different, but um, the, still, the same pattern still kind of um, pertains. Next slide, please. Hi, my name is Erica Hernandez. Um, I live in Long Island and I'm a high school student. Uh, next slide, please. So on these next few slides, we'll be talking about some strategies on how we can help prevent um, this extreme heat. So one way we can help prevent from this extreme heat is planting trees. So urban tree planting is essential in reducing extreme heat in our neighborhoods. Trees provide natural shade, which helps to cool down services like sidewalks, roads, and buildings that absorb heat during the day. This reduces the um, urban heat island effect where urban areas become significantly warmer than their surroundings. So trees release uh, moisture through a process called transpiration, which cools the surrounding air. This process not only helps to lower temperature locally, but also improves overall air, air quality by filtering out pollutants and capturing carbon dioxide. So our next steps will be to collaborate closely with local schools, um, community organizations, and businesses to strategically plant trees in areas that experience high temperatures. By strategically planting trees, we can create cooler, more comfortable outdoor spaces for residents or really anyone, reduce energy costs associated with air conditioning, and enhance the overall liberty of our city. Uh, next slide. Hi, my name is Grace. Um, I'm a second year medical student at the Jacobs School of Medicine in Buffalo. Um, and kind of going off of increasing urban tree planting, another way we can mitigate the ur urban heat island effect is just increasing larger urban green spaces to kind of break up the large buildings and roads, which are absorbing all the sun's heat and re-emitting it back out, which is causing the urban heat island effect. So for this, what we can do is prioritize vacant lot space to be used for urban green spaces like parks, um, we can also utilize rooftop spaces for rooftop greenery and rooftop gardens, um, as well as, like Erica mentioned, planting trees along sidewalks and roads. Next slide, please. 
And then another way that we can kind of mitigate the effects of extreme heat is through cool roof initiatives. So traditional black asphalt roofs that are on, you know, schools, hospitals, community buildings, um, they can reach up to 190 degrees Fahrenheit on a hot day. Um, but installing a white reflective rooftop can actually reduce the internal building temperature by up to 30%, as well as save on 10 to 30% of air conditioning costs. So an initiative is being done in New York City um, called the New York City Cool Roofs Project, and that's part of the city's goal of reducing carbon emissions by 2050. Um, so for our Now What, we can bring a similar initiative to areas like Syracuse and Albany to place these roofs on schools and community centers um, to help residents and reduce the effects of extreme heat. Next slide. Um, so just to sum things up, um, extreme heat significantly impacts health and as temperatures continue to rise, so will these exacerbations. Um, these exacerbations include early school dismissals, increased congenital defects, worsening asthma exacerbations, increased injuries, mental health emergencies, risk of cardiovascular disease, and more, with the risk being even higher in vulnerable communities. Um, so now what? Um, to curb these impacts, we're asking you to invest in urban tree planting initiatives, implement cool roofs in schools and housing, as seen in Syracuse and Albany, um, and to continue to advocate for climate change, because if we don't take action, things will only get worse from here. Okay, thank you so much. We had a number of um, comments and questions coming in um, in the chat. A lot of uh, compliments on your excellent use of maps. Um, and I think it's really a testimony to all the great data um, that's available from the state. And I'm so glad that you all um, learned how to access that. Um, there is a question um, from Lisa Lawrence. Um, and the question is, are there specific environmental issues in those mapped areas with high percentages of asthma? Heat makes asthma worse, but is there something in the environment causing it in the first place? Great question. Does anyone um, from your group wanna take that? I could talk a little bit about, I'm not, I'm from Albany, so I'm a little more familiar with that area. Like there's one um, neighborhood in Albany that I think is included in that map, the South End, um, that it's kind of right underneath the highway of 787. There's a, the Port of Albany is there and there, the state actually has done some different studies um, looking at like what the traffic is there because of the really poor air quality in that area. And they've just found there's like a ton of local traffic with trucks and buses coming through. And um, I think that's definitely impacting health in that area. I'm not as versed on um, Syracuse or those areas. So maybe someone else could add in if they know more about those. Um, I'm happy to chime in um, as an asthma specialist. Um, I think that it's multifactorial and really like a chicken and egg. Um, extreme heat or any extremes of weather, so hot, humid air can absolutely trigger the airways and make asthma worse. Um, but I think what we're seeing as we look um, at these maps is that children who live in these areas of extreme heat have a lot of exposures. And so it's multifactorial. We know that many of those exposures, such as traffic-related air pollution, um, living in homes that have poor ventilation, and so they trap more heat, um, those can all be risk factors for asthma. Um, so it definitely compounds and can be a trigger for acute asthma exacerbations. But from a prevention standpoint, it can also be causative um, in a child developing asthma. So um, definitely see it on both ends. Thank you for that great question. Okay, thanks so much. Um, there was also um, a link added from our scholar Kelly Galloway um, with the Albany Group. Um, who has added a great example of the community calling for action and working with the state to identify risks and concerns in the Albany South End community. So you can learn more about, um, about those um, health concerns in the Albany region. Um, so with that, we will now pass uh, the mic over to the Hudson Valley region, um, who will be presenting findings about extreme heat in the Hudson Valley.
Thanks, Dr. Evans. Um, so we'll just go ahead and get right into it. Um, again, my name is Kelly. I am the coordinator at the Albany Center, as well as the facilitator for our Hudson Valley Group as a recent Westchester resident. So with that, um, next slide, please. Um, this is just recapping everything that Dr. Galvez talked about in the beginning. So I'll have you skip to the next slide too, as well. Um, so this is our group. I'll have each of them introduce themselves um, when they present their slides. Again, just highlighting that we're from all over the state and at all different points of our education uh, journey. So with that, I'll pass it over to our first speaker, uh, Loretta. Hello, I'm Loretta, and um, I'm going to talk about what is extreme heat. So extreme heat is defined as abnormally hot weather. And in New York, extreme heat is considered to be above 90 degrees um, with high humidity. Periods of extreme heat lasting three or more days are known as heat waves. And we've been getting a lot more heat waves lately, especially like in June. And there was one like this past this past week. Um, so it's it's been getting worse lately. And it, it's one of the leading causes of death among other hazardous weathered events in the United States. And it is severely affecting the health and well-being of New Yorkers across the state and even the country. In recent years, the concentration of greenhouse gases, or gases in the atmosphere that trap the sun's heat, has increased. In smaller amounts, greenhouse gases are beneficial to us because they prevent the Earth from getting too cold. However, the increased presence of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere means that more and more heat is being trapped in the atmosphere, and temperatures are slowly but surely rising. Next slide, please. Hi, my name is Erin Salder, and I'm from Oneonta, New York, and I'm currently going to school for my master's in public health at the University of Albany. Um, the map on the left shows the average monthly temperature in New York for July since 2000 has been 77 degrees. Uh, the average daily maximum temperature for July since 2000 has been 84.8 degrees, and we well exceeded average temperatures this year. And then you can see the map on the right shows the heat alert in the lower Hudson on June 18, 2024. According to local news sources, many schools had to cancel either class or dismiss early in the lower Hudson and Metro New York area. With most recently, last week, the National Weather Service extended the heat advisory from Monday to Wednesday. With the conclusion of the third documented heat wave, last week, the National Weather Service says July 2024 is aiming to be one of the hottest months on record. In addition, the heat warning issued many individuals living in the lower Hudson region have to worry about air quality. With many more days of heat and poor air quality, it is important to consider how its impacts occur unevenly across communities and are worsened by socioeconomic, environmental, age, and health-related conditions. Vulnerable groups affected by poor air quality days and extreme heat include children. Next slide, please. Um, my name is Sherry. I'm a second year medical student at New York Medical College, and I'll be talking about the so what. Um, a little, we've all touched on this a little bit, but I'm just going to talk a little bit more specifically in the Hudson Valley region about the pediatric health impacts of extreme heat. Um, so as we've discussed, children are extremely vulnerable to extreme heat and schools and homes without air conditioning or proper ventilation pose a huge risk to the health of children. It may be too hot in school to concentrate, especially during exams, and it may be too hot to spend time outside of the school building, which poses a, a, an issue, especially for children with with asthma um, and outside you might run into artificial turf, which absorbs more heat than natural grass does, making it feel about 10 degrees hotter than it otherwise would. And um, children are also very bad at taking water breaks in general. <laughs> Hi, my name is SJ. I'm from Rochester, New York and a rising sophomore at the University of Buffalo, majoring in public health and minoring in chemistry. So a bit of a personal experience, I'm a childcare worker and I work usually when I'm in my break back from school up in Rochester. And this is a school that I usually work at. So I remember the last week of school, there was a huge heat wave and our school district has no air conditioning. So I remember the cafeteria where our program is held reached 92 degrees Fahrenheit. And due to the temperature, we couldn't take them to the gym. We couldn't go outside. It was way too hot to do anything. And on top of this, our school district implemented half days the entire week. So our program is usually from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., but we had to go from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. this time. And that just made it a whole lot challenging in terms of staffing and uh, parents having to be picking up their kids early and with coming home from work early. So all we could do really was just play board games, draw, and hope the fans cooled us off enough. Next slide, please. 
Hi, my name is Spencer Hammond. I am from Westchester, New York, and I am a rising sophomore at Mamaroneck High School. Um, I've had many personal experiences. Um, this new extreme heat in my school. There are multiple days throughout the year where uh sports practices were canceled due to the extreme heat. I was on the football team, and all our practices were moved to night. And we were not allowed to wear pads. Um, it also affected us during my lacrosse playoff run. We uh, could only do walkthroughs because it was too hot to um, do like full speed practices. And many people almost passed out. And some people would have to sit out practices due to the heat. Next slide, please. Hi, my name's Emma Polinski, and I'm from Long Island, New York, and I'm going to be a junior at Huntington High School this year. So what now? What's going on already that how are we dealing in New York with climate change and extreme heat? So communication is a key part to um, doing well with these challenges um, with our climate, and New York is already doing it. Having an official response is a critical and beneficial step in preparing for the extreme heat waves that New Yorkers have experienced throughout this year. This past June, Governor Kathy Hochul and several other government officials issued a response surrounding how the different departments of New York would respond to an upcoming heat wave. Examples of how these various departments plan to respond to the heat include the Office of Children's Family Services, when they stated that they would be checking on cooling equipment, ensuring proper amounts of water were available and consumed, rescheduling activities and meetings, and identifying staff and clients who may be affected by the heat. Other modes of communication, like news outlets and social media, are equally as important to give out information like cooling centers and event cancellations during times of extreme heat. Emergency communication plans are versions of um, adaptations to climate change and extreme heat. Next slide, please. So moving on, there are other adaptations and mitigations that we can um, see in places that are beyond New York State, and we can look at them, reflect upon them, and try and identify how we can apply certain changes to where we live as well. So an example of an adaptation is in Miami, where the chief heat officer, which seems to be a very interesting role, advocates for 10 minute breaks for outdoor workers that are working above temperatures of 32 degrees Celsius. A policy such as this would also be beneficial in New York because of the amount of money lost due to decrease in productivity resulting from extreme heat. In 2020, the loss of labor as a result of heat exposure cost the economy about $100 billion. And this figure is projected to grow to $500 billion annually by the year 2050. Small changes can go a long way. So considering changes such as these um, and adapting them to different work fields throughout New York could save the government a lot of money and also ensure safety of many. An example of a mitigation that is in a place beyond New York State is that in New Jersey, they were the first state to require teaching students about climate change in 2020. Educating kids about pressing environmental issues is important so that they know how to stay safe or even contribute to making their communities safer. Uh, next slide. Hi, my name is Amanda. I'm from Wappingers Falls, New York, and I'm a rising sophomore at Johns Hopkins University majoring in molecular and cellular biology. So what is solar energy? Solar energy is any type of energy generated by the sun. Solar energy works by converting energy from the sun into power. Mitigation and adaptation efforts. Solar energy is both mitigation and adaptation because we are adapting to the high temperatures from climate change and using renewable energy like solar can help mitigate the effects of global warming. Solar energy is valuable because it lessens our overall greenhouse gas emissions. Schools use a lot of energy to power lights, computers, Wi-Fi, and so on. By introducing solar into schools, there would be a decrease in destructive greenhouse gases being released into the atmosphere. Other districts across the United States have begun to use solar and are saving great sums of money in the long term on utility bills. Solar systems installed at schools 
were also forecast to save the Louisa district in Virginia up to $8 million over three decades, according to the New York Times. With the introduction of solar, it would be easier for more schools to invest in air conditioning without the, that addition of the new systems contributing to increasing temperatures outside because of the use of renewable energy. If all of the roughly 130,000 K through 12 schools were to fully transition to solar, Generation 180 calculated that there'd be an annual reduction of 60 million metric tons in carbon emissions, the equivalent of shuttering 16 coal-fired power plants, according to the New York Times. So um, in summary, just kind of closing the loop, uh, climate change and extreme heat have a massive impact on children's health. So what uh, extreme heat is problematic to vulnerable groups like children and now at various methods like education on climate change in schools or utilizing renewable energy or any of the other recommendations the groups previously have said are all solutions for creating a healthier future. Um, I just want to quickly thank uh, yesterday we had the opportunity to talk to Senator Harkman and his team um, and kind of give our presentation to him. And we had a really wonderful discussion on the various different careers into environment uh, besides just medicine or public health. And that was very um, great to have that. Um, with that, I'll pass it over to um, Dr. Evans to maybe uh, touch at the 1 p.m. and then switch over to Long Island. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. That was really amazing. And these presentations have been so diverse and impactful. Um, we can open it to any questions or comments. Um, I was wondering if any of the students would like to share any reflections from your experience in meeting with Senator Harkum. Um, you know, what was that like? And um, how, how did that exchange go? And um, was he receptive to, um, your suggestions and your information that you shared. Erin, because I can see you, I'm going to just pick on you. Did you maybe want to um, reflect on how yesterday went? Yeah, so I think he was very receptive of everything that we said. And it was really interesting because he kind of gave his background about like how he got into like environmental health, the politics, and he was telling us how he didn't really know what he wanted to do growing up and that he kind of just like did his own path and figured it out along the way. So that was really nice to hear. And he was like, you don't have to have everything figured out right now. Like you can figure it out as you go. So it was a really, really great um, meeting with him. Yeah, and I'll just, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to add, um, you know, we do have such a diverse group of students, so some are able to vote for the first time, um, as well as we have some high schoolers who aren't able to vote, but there's um, so many different opportunities for you to get your voice to be heard at um, various different age um, levels and education levels, so that was really great to be able to connect that way. Um, I do see a question from um, Dana. Dana? Yes, I think it's Assembly Member Levenberg has raised yes. their hand. Would you like to? Hi. Hi. Yeah, I just want to. Hi. I'm so sorry that I hadn't joined late, but um, and I'm in the car driving. But I just wanted to say that I thought the I I got to see the Hudson Valley presentation or here uh, the Hudson Valley presentation, which is so great, and I do support the legislation in uh, New York State that hopefully will mirror the uh, requirement for teaching climate change in our schools. I think that that's so important. So grateful to have Senator Harcom as the chair of the Environmental Conservation Committee in the Senate. Um, he's such a great partner. And, um, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can. It's a, one of my priorities certainly is to protect our precious environment and our natural resources. Uh, so I'm thankful again for all that um, you are doing to um, educate and empower um, students uh, to advocate and um, work towards uh, a more sustainable future. We know that we have not acted fast enough, um, so we need to act now to do everything we can uh, to protect our environment, and uh, we can't um, roll back the, um, the 
goals of the CLCPA or the or the deadlines, um, and we need to again make sure we we um, hold uh, polluters accountable, which we were um, did get really good legislation passed to hold some of the fossil fuel um, industry accountable for uh, their um, impact on, on climate change so that they can help build clean infrastructure. And, uh, and we need to continue to work in that direction. I'm hoping that we can get New York heat passed uh, to get rid of the requirements to build out gas infrastructure. Um, and uh, I, I personally have a bill to get rid of the need to have uh, alienation of parkland every time we want to put a solar canopy in a park parking lot. Um, so I'm hoping that that can get over the finish line at some point in the not too distant future. Um, and again, just so happy for all the good work that you guys are doing and thank you. Thank you so much for sharing and, and being able to join us today. Um, because of time, I'll, I'll pass it to Sarah to maybe get us started for the next group. Um, but thank you all for the comments and, and for being here and, and listening to us. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Levenberg, for those really valuable and inspiring comments. It's so, from our side, it's so um, encouraging to hear, um, you know, that there is support on the legislative side and across the state. And I think, again, uh, I think someone touched on voting, um, and many of the students in this program are not yet of voting age, but I think it just highlights the importance of um, voting and helping to get out the vote um, for representatives who really support uh programs and policies that will protect vulnerable communities from the climate crisis. Um, so that's my quick voting soapbox, but we can move on now um, to hear from our final group um, who are representing um, the New York City and Long Island region. And I, I also just also wanted to say that um, for anyone who has to leave early um, who, who, or who joined late, we are happy to share um, these slides with you afterwards so that you can review all the great work that the students have done. Um, so I will pass it over now um, to our final group. Oops. Hi, everyone. Hi. No, that's okay. You can move on to the next slide, too. Um, my name is Biddy. I'm one of the uh, NICE Czech scholars for Long Island, and I've also been mentoring um, the Long Island uh, group of Long Island and New York City group of students um, who are some of them are pictured here. Um, so just a refresher, I know you guys heard a little bit about what Nice Check is in the beginning and what Nice Check Summer Academy is, um, but we are a group a of high school, college and med school and beyond students um, who are interested in addressing climate change and impacts on children's health. And um, I will pass it along to Liza to um, start our presentation. Hi, I'm Aliza. Um, I'm a second year medical student at New York Medical College, and I live in the Bronx. Um, so we're going to be talking um, a lot about the South Bronx today in our presentation. Um, an average of 350 New Yorkers die from the heat in New York City each summer, um, which is really an anyone, any one person dying from heat is, is too many. Um, so 350 is a lot. Um, and the South Bronx neighborhood neighborhoods um, are on average eight degrees hotter than um, other neighborhoods in the city that are less than a mile away. Um, so just looking at kind of the basic heat map there, you can see that there are different parts of the city that are disproportionately affected by heat. Next slide. Thank you. So in, um, in New York City, we consider um, extreme heat temperatures above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, but just in general, um, heat has the levels of heat have been increasing over time. Um, we know that greenhouse gas emissions are causing the planet to heat up. We're experiencing climate change um, every day, every year. And as the planet be has become warmer and continues to become warmer, the frequency, intensity, and duration of heat waves are increasing across the country. Um, next slide, please. So in New York state, um, the average and maximum temperatures are continuing to rise and our state is warming quicker than the national average. New York City itself is the warmest part of the state. 
Um, there in general is a greater impact, a greater heat impact in urban areas due to the abundance of roads, parking lots and buildings, um, as well as the lack of green spaces. Um, so this map is showing again the heat vulnerability indices across the country. You can see it's not uniform, I mean, not across the country, <laughs> across the city. You can see that it is not uniform um, across New York City. And I put that little turquoise, um, if you can see it, it's a little small to kind of point you in the direction of the South Bronx, um, which is what we're, we're focused on today with our group. Um, but there are a variety of different areas that have particularly high heat vulnerability indices. Many of the areas with the highest level of heat vulnerability are home to Black and Hispanic communities. Um, you can see on the chart on the bottom there, the average annual rate per million people of heat-related deaths between 2013 and 2022. And you can see that Black and Hispanic communities are experiencing the highest rates of heat-related deaths. In general, under-resourced communities are at a high risk for extreme weather-related deaths, and the federal redlining in the 1930s resulted in many Black and Hispanic communities across the city being exposed to more extreme heat due to their dense populations and lack of heat-reducing features like green spaces, shade, and water. Next slide, please. Hi, um, I'm Ava Rubenstein, and I am a resident of New York City, and I'm a high school student. I'm a rising senior. Um, so we just compiled some of the recent headlines um, across New York City, and they're all discussing different experiences with extreme heat. So the first one, Scorched by History, um, discusses the extreme heat effects specifically on vulnerable populations. Um, and the caption mentions that Black residents die from heat stress at double the rate of white residents in NYC, which is um, obviously a big issue. And additionally, it mentions that statistic that we previously mentioned um, where temperatures in the South Bronx are eight degrees higher than on the Upper East and West Sides, which is a pretty alarming statistic. Um, and then the article called Dog Days of Summer discusses the impact of extreme heat upon New York City residents and highlights some methods of staying cool um, and discusses many city initiatives that attempt to combat the effects of extreme heat, um, which is definitely worth looking into, such as cooling stations throughout the city um, and other initiatives that help New York City residents um, stay cool in extreme heat um, and extreme weather. And furthermore, um, the final article on the screen, um, the article about New York City area schools um, is a list of over 20 schools that have been forced to close early simply due to the effects of extreme heat, which is extremely alarming. Um, and next slide, please, thank you. Um, so these are some experiences with extreme heat in NYC. Um, I saw that this experience, this experience was highlighted in the chat as well, um, but we wanted to highlight um, the exposure of playing on turf fields because turf fields are um, dangerous for kind of one of or one or two reasons. Um, first of all, they trap heat. And when children play on turf fields in hot weather, um, they're exposed to more heat than they would be just kind of walking around or playing on grass fields because um, the chemicals in the turf trap the heat, um, which causes a higher risk of dehydration and heat related illness, which is um, a danger for children. And furthermore, um, many turf fields also have chemicals in them um, that can cause children to be exposed to chemicals. Um, so not only are they do they pose risks for extreme heat related illnesses, but they also can elevate um, chemicals in the bloodstream. And furthermore, um, in just one day, there were more than 25 ER visits across New York City um, related to only extreme heat. And these numbers are only continuing to rise as extreme heat um, becomes more prevalent throughout New York City and throughout the country. And furthermore, um, though 90% of households across the five boroughs have air conditioning units, that number greatly varies across neighborhoods. And since we're focusing on the South Bronx, um, it's important to highlight that only 76% of the residents in the South Bronx have air conditioning and air conditioning is an extremely helpful resource for those trying to combat extreme heat and not having air conditioning exposes them um, to extreme heat more so than it would be if they were um, able to access this resource. So, next slide, thank you. Hi, I'm Tiffany and I'm a rising sophomore in high school on Long Island. Um, so what communities are at most risk of extreme heat? Older residents with health conditions experiencing social isolation or limited mobility, along with individuals with mental illnesses, undomiciled individuals, and um, people who work in hot outdoor places like construction workers, 
are all vulnerable and more likely to be impacted by the heat. Next slide. Um, additionally, infants and children up to four years old and pregnant people are more sensitive to heat. Also seen in pregnant people, the increase of their body temperature can cause premature labor and lower birth weights. Next slide. Hi everyone, my name is Sanari Hanayaka and I'm a second year medical student at New York Medical College. Uh, what we're looking at on this slide is a tree equity score for Mott Haven, which is a neighborhood in the South Bronx. And you can see the score for this area is 62. And scores less than 70 from this uh, equity score indicate that there's a major need for more equitable tree coverage in this specific area. And we can also see on the right hand side, it comes with a priority index. And it shows that specifically in this area, people of color, uh, the 92%, as well as people in poverty, 85%, have an increased need for tree coverage in this area, which demonstrates that marginalized communities are being disproportionately affected by the lack of tree coverage. Next slide. And these next couple slides are from New York City's Heat Vulnerability Index. And we're looking at Mott Haven again as an equal comparison. Uh, so this slide shows that in Mott Haven, there's less AC and green space than other New York City neighborhoods. Um, next slide. And it also shows that the lower median income than other New York City neighborhoods, but despite these, they have a higher temperature. Um, so it shows that in Mott Haven, these other factors contribute to an increased temperature and the lower median income could contribute to why they don't have accessible AC to combat these increased temperatures. Next slide. Uh, so this is a bar graph of the heat stress death rate in New York City. And as you can see, the Black non-Hispanic race are greatly impacted by the extreme heat. And as said before, this mostly stems from structural racism. Um, that includes fewer job opportunities and lower pay and less access to high quality education and health care. Uh, this system tends to limit the access of the resources to protect health as Black New Yorkers are more prone to poverty and have less um, access to air conditioning. Next slide. Hi, my name is Naya Jackson. I am a second year medical student at the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. Um, so we wanted to just highlight also some of the policies or um, different things that are going on in the city to help mitigate the extreme heat. So the New York City Emergency Management is an organization that's working to help um, New York City residents meet the heat. So some of the resources include uh, maps of cooling centers around the city, cool kits, information about the risk, and then safety tips. The next slide, um, we'll go more into that. But it's also important that they educate the public on ways that they can beat the heat of things that they can also control. So they can like beat the heat by staying out of the sun and staying like cool places, avoiding, avoiding hard labor during the sun peak hours, which is usually around 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. So they try to recommend for people to kind of like, if you have to do strenuous things to do anywhere from four to seven, but obviously that can be hard depending on your occupation. So if you are working Working in places that um, forces you to kind of be outdoors to make sure that you're resting, staying in the shade, and then also staying hydrated by having water breaks every 15 minutes, eating small frequent meals, um, seeking out air conditioned places like movie theaters, and then also wearing light weight clothing can help like um, residents beat the heat as well. Next slide. Hi, I'm Ramesa Agamoni, and I'm from Mount Cruz, New York, and I'm a rising junior at Connecticut College, and I'll briefly cover some of the current New York City local policies and programs that are put in place to combat the extreme heat. So listed below are several newly implemented policies and programs that I've researched, but for the sake of time, I'll only focus on a few that are like most relevant to our vulnerable population that we're studying. So to start off, um, the New York City Cool Roofs Program, which it's been mentioned before, trains local individuals to work with a team to coat city rooftops with an energy saving, white reflective coating in hopes of limiting the effects of extreme heat. This program has the goal of installing 1 million square feet of rooftops per year. Next, New York City designed an interactive 24-7 cool options map, and this allows New Yorkers to easily locate cooling centers throughout the city. It highlights water features such as nearby sprinklers, drinking fountains, and outdoor pools for people to easily cool down in. And it also shows nearby New York City parks that are densely populated with trees so you can aid in shade. And finally, emphasizes which communities have the highest heat vulnerability index so people can hopefully try to avoid them. 
And finally, New York City implemented the Cool Kits for Vulnerable Populations. And basically, this is a program where New York City Emergency Management plans to distribute cool kits that, and they contain um, heat safety items such as cooling towels, ice packs, electrolyte powder, and sunscreen. And they're mostly focused towards delivery drivers, outdoor workers, and other at-risk groups. And these are people that have no option but to work in the extreme heat. So overall, these plans hope to increase awareness about the dangers associated with extreme heat, and they hope to educate the public about heat safety information, especially when it comes to vulnerable populations so they can all beat the heat. Thank you. Um, so now we're gonna cover adaption and mitigation strategies. Um, so we wanted to talk about some policy change. So although there is a program, I can't remember the exact name, that helps increase air conditioners that are like distributed across the city, but we believe that there should be a New York City policy to mandate landlords to provide air conditioning during the summer, because although some of our residents can go to um, these cool spaces, it's important that they are also staying cool in their own homes. And then some of the co-benefits is imp um, improving tenant comfort and quality of life and allows community to adapt to the heat waves and changing temperatures, not only of course in the public, but also in their own homes. Some of the consequences is that it increases the energy um, consumption for the AC and then also the cost burden that may be applied to the landlords and may trickle down to the residents. Next slide. Okay. Um, another adaptation mitigation mitigation strategy um for extreme heat is implementing green infrastructure. Green infrastructure reduces temperature by providing shade. Um, green infrastructure is where you use nature to help cities manage green water, cool down, and clean air. So examples of green infrastructure is green roofs, green walls, parking, green spaces, and cooling centers. Um, a study shows that green roofs um, cool near surface temperatures by 14% compared to solar panels. Um, green infrastructure reduces temperature by providing shade. It also provides... Um, several health benefits. Um, and um, as with, such as um, decreasing pollution and respiratory alignments, coughing and aggravation of asthma. Um, there, um, also, there are potential consequences. Um, green infrastructure could be uh, expensive. It does need a constant maintenance and it may be destroyed during extreme we weather like storm. Um, over here is like an image, an example image of green infrastructure implemented in Singapore. As you can see, um, the they blend um, green infrastructure beautifully with like buildings. All right, next slide. Uh, my name is Gloria Zhao. I'm a second year medical student at New York Medical College. Um, so there are solutions that we can propose that combat extreme heat. Um, as we discussed before, one of these solutions includes substituting turf fields with grass fields. This is especially important for children as they're out of school for the summer. They're participating in summer camps and sports, so they're spending more time outside and on fields. Um, and some of the concern for this is that grass fields do require more maintenance, but this also presents um, an, op an opportunity for new jobs. Um, another solution is making sure that the heat benefit is funded throughout the entire the entirety of the summer, um, as we've experienced with climate change. Um, the summer season tends, uh, it seems like it's becoming longer and longer. So it's really important that um, residents have the help that they need for the entirety of the summer. Um, for urban areas, it's also important to create more green spaces because it has been shown that they can lower temperatures. Um, so it's important to inform the public about all this. So not many people may know about the public resources that are available to them. 
and what policies are in place. So we want to spread the information via public campaigns and community outreach so people can be informed on what is accessible to them. Um, it's also important for people to recognize the signs of heat illness and exhaustion so that they can get help quickly and improve health outcomes. Next slide. Um, so it's important in order to get these things done to identify legislators who are working to combat extreme heat like we're doing now. Um, so we want to inform them about how important this topic is, how it affects our communities and the health effects of extreme heat. Um, and then we can also propose these policies and solutions that we've discussed um, to work against extreme heat. We can also work with and support organizations um, by working with other passionate people, we can propose solutions um, to act against this, and we can also listen to community members and find out how extreme heat affects them directly, and we can advocate for the proposed solutions based on their own lived experience. Next slide. So just to wrap up, um, by working together with legislators, public health professionals, and individuals motivated to addressing extreme heat, we can make an impactful change in the health of vulnerable populations, such as children living in areas that are disproportionately affected by extreme heat. Thank you. Well, that was amazing. <laughs> and it concludes our programming for today. We do have two minutes left. Um, incredible job staying on time. That is really hard to do. Um, we have like two minutes left for any questions or comments. I did uh, this uh, QR code here, here will take you to our nice check page where you can learn more about all of the resources and programs available through nice check, including the summer program, which will run again next summer. So please be thinking ahead if you know of any students who might be interested. Um, and I also had a link in the chat to our prescriptions for prevention. The previous group mentioned, um, you know, work towards educating the public about steps that you can take to protect yourself. And that's something that our prescriptions for prevention program does for extreme heat and other um, topics. So please, um, you know, feel free. We're getting um, a lot of um, inspired, um, and positive messaging in the chat right now, but feel free to raise your hand or or put any final comments into the chat. Really, really excellent work. Thank you all so much.